family is on vacation, staying here in the World Mart, overlooking the cliff, and there is the ocean in the background, which is our daily view. But uh, since I'm not speaking this weekend, I lined up a video with Dick Foth, who was the president of uh, Bethany College and Assemblies of God School in uh, Santa Santa Cruz, California, for about 15 years. The Lord led him into ministry to the business community and the political circles. Since then, he's based out of Washington, D.C., and is on the teaching staff at National Community Church with uh, Mark Batterson. In fact, he is a mentor and a spiritual father to Mark Batterson in this church, which is very politically incorrect in a politically correct world, Washington, D.C., of all places. But uh, I think you will appreciate what he has to, to share about sharing the gospel in this world that needs Jesus so much. We're in a series. This is the end of the series. We had three about this congregation, about the kingdom of God, characterized by naming and healing. And this week it's sending. And I'm saying, Lord, send me anywhere. Like, how about Hawaii? And I've just, no, okay. The summer of 1945 was huge for me. World War II was coming to an end. Germany surrendered May 7th. Japan surrendered August 14th. And in June, our family arrived in New York City by train from California. This is our family, this little group here. That's Oliver. My mom, Gwen, my sister, Luann, and me. They called me Dickie. I was three. Very cute. Do not know what happened. <laughs> we were there. We had our passport. That, that's the naming part. Had our name, had our birth dates, it had our place of birth. It was our citizenship. It was our identity. That's what naming is about. It was a place of healing for me because in June, they had a scarlet fever epidemic in New York City. I got it. It went into a mastoid infection in my ears, and they took me to the doctor, and he said that's going into his brain, and we don't know if we can stop it. We need to do surgery. Three days later, they were getting ready to do, to do surgery, and my folks had sent what they called night letters. You didn't have email or text or any of that. Night letters to California for the congregations that were supporting us because we were going as missionaries. And they said, pray for Dickie. And early in the morning, when it was supposed to be the operation day, the doctor called my, my father and said, Reverend, I'm looking at two sets of x-rays. This one shows this virulent infection from several days ago. And the one I just took shows nothing at all. I don't know what kind of a God you serve, but this is tremendous. So the healing part came into play for me when I was three. I didn't understand the theological thing or anything like that. I just knew that it was better than before, right? And then we were sent. New York Harbor was a place that saw sending for the last four years, from 41 to 45, three million United States soldiers and sailors sailed on mission out of New York Harbor. Their mission was to win a war. Their mission was to overwhelm evil. Their mission was to liberate captives. And now a little family of four was off to do the same, if you will. I had no idea what sending was about. I'm three for Pete's sake. No idea. But we had been commissioned, prayed over, and were being sent on a Swedish liner called the MS Gripsholm. MS Gripsholm had been a liner, and then they made it into a, into a troop carrier, a ship. And we sailed on that ship to Piraeus, Greece, Naples, Italy, Haifa, Palestine, Alexandria, Egypt, and Bombay, India. Why? Because we had been sent. Naming, healing, sending is what the kingdom is about. It's what NCC is about. And I was just thinking, how many NCCers, how many folks from National Community Church have come through here over the last 20-some years through Union Station, Ebenezer's, Potomac Yard, Ballston, Georgetown, Lincoln, Kingstown, Miracle, Gainesville, Echo, now Capital Turner. How many are scattered around the, the, the world, scattered over the face of the earth, in every strata of society, not just in government. There are people who are plumbers. There are people who are teachers. There are people who work 
in all strata of life. People in the carpenters' union. People, just all of these places. And they were living lives. They're living lives because they were touched here. They saw transformation here in, in this space called National Community Church. Two or three years ago, I was flying out here to speak, and I sat down on the window seat in the exit aisle, like, like a little exit, little room for my legs. Young man from Pakistan came and sat next to me, and I didn't feel like talking. I don't know if you fly very much, but sometimes you just don't feel like talking. And for a talker like me, I'm a guy who finds out what he's thinking even as he speaks. Uh, you know, not talking is pretty, but I thought, you know, I'm just tired. So I had the headphone, headphones on and I was just, but then when the, when the drinks came, you know, I got my, whatever it was, tonic with lime as my drink of choice. And so I'm, I'm sitting there and we start chatting and I could tell that the young woman on the aisle was listening. And pretty soon she leaned over and said, excuse me, are you Dick Foth? And I'm saying, how do you know that? She said, because I heard you speak at National Community Church years ago when they only had about 50 people, and we were in one of the first small groups out there in Falls Church. You never know where you people are going to show up. I'm just saying, <laughs> okay? So you, so you go from 19 to now somewhere between three and 4,000, median age is 28. I love telling people that. But this, to me, is like a military training platform, a place of launching and you say, how does that happen? It happens one way. When individuals have an encounter with the Most High God. Way back, from earliest times, God gets in the habit, apparently, of saying, come here, come. Now go there. That's sort of his, his mode. Come here, go there. There's this great story that you find in Exodus. It's about a, a shepherd who used to be in government work, and uh, his name was Moses, raised in the courts of Pharaoh, made a bad move, killed a guy, had to run for his life, and now he's an 80-year-old dude in the deserts of the Middle East, and he goes out one day, and there's a bush that's burning, and it's apparently spontaneously combusting. That can happen in the desert, but this this bush was not burning up, and this is what it says in Exodus 3. So Moses thought, I'll go over and see the strange sight why the bush does not burn up. And when the Lord saw that he'd gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals for the place where you're standing is holy ground. And then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. So now go. Moses, come here, now go. So now go, I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Now, he doesn't want to go clearly. His face is on all the wanted posters in every post office in Egypt, so he's not wanting to go there. And God said, I'll be with you. When, and this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you worship God on this mountain. And Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what's his name? Then what shall I tell him? Now, when you don't want to go someplace, you're sort of shuffling and trying to back away. And this is Moses. And God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you're to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. Moses says two things in this little context. One is, who am I and who are you? When I face who he is, I discover who I am. When I face who he is, I discover who I am because I'm made in his image. You're made in his image. We look like the Most High God. Even though we come in all shapes and sizes and frames and colors and backgrounds, we we look like him. This is not just any off-the-shelf God. This is, this is not just, I'm in a jam, help me out here, God. This is not, in, in, a, in a culture that designs its God, this is a God who designs us. This is, this is the Lord God Almighty. This is the creator of all, the all-knowing, redeemer, provider, healer, sustainer, that name above every name, the king of the universe who speaks billions of galaxies. I just heard that. Billions of galaxies 
into existence. He's the great I am. He's the lion of Judah. He's the lamb of God. He is the way, the truth, the life, the good shepherd. He's the king of kings and lord of lords. You can say hallelujah or something there if you want. You know, I just, I'm just saying. He calls, commissions, empowers, and sends. He is the sender. We, NCC, this is the agency, if you will, is the community of faith that encourages and implements his call. Now, Moses was nervous. I mean, he, if you go on to read that text, he says, now, now I can't go to Pharaoh. I can't go to Pharaoh because I stutter. Well, I was a stutterer for a bunch of years when I was a kid and up into my teen years. And I just, you know, it makes you nervous. And sometimes I have excuses. Sometimes I say, I just can't do it. And it doesn't make any difference what role you're in. I'm 36 years old back in the day, long time ago, and I, uh, I was president of a small college. And the, the, the role of a college president or a university president, as someone well put it, is a person who lives in a big house and begs. Because you're going out to try to raise money for the university. And I was going to Sunnyvale, California. It's in Silicon Valley. And uh, there's an old farmer there who owned 50 acres of pears in downtown Sunnyvale. If you're going to own 50 acres of pears, have it in downtown Sunnyvale. And people thought he was just an old farmer. He was a very cagey farmer. He was a very sharp guy. And I went and I wanted to ask him for a million dollars. This is 1979. I wanted to ask. I'd never asked anybody for a million. I'm nervous as a cat. But I felt the Lord was in this school. The Lord was, was in this thing. It wasn't about me. It was about the mission. And I sat on his porch with him. And I just said, uh, John, his name was John Stoll. I said, I've been thinking and praying about this. And would you give a live, lead gift to this project, like of a million dollars? And I'd prayed like crazy, Lord help. And he turned to me. He looked at me and grinned and said, how soon do you need that? And I about passed out <laughs> because like I'd prayed, but I didn't really think that, you know, anyway, <laughs> that sort of thing. And then I'm 51 years old, and I'm here in D.C. It's 1993, and I'm going to my first meeting with a senator. We just walked with various people in leadership. Many of you have heard me tell this, and I'm, I'm whining as I'm going through the Russell office building, the Senate office building, saying, I'm a kid from East Oakland. What do I say to a United States senator? And I felt like the Lord said this to me, not like in verbal like a voice, but he, I think he just sort of said, Foth, here's the deal. If you speak with the king of the universe in the morning, it's not so tough to speak to a United States senator in the afternoon. <laughs> and I've shared that a number of times. And so a few years ago, I got a note from an NCCer who was in an embassy on, in the foreign service in Eastern Europe and said, before I came here, I was called to the White House to brief the Obama administration, the National Security Council, on the area I was going with. And I was so frightened. I was so nervous. And then I remembered that thing about if you speak to the king of the universe in the morning, it's not so tough to speak to the United States Senate in the afternoon. And it was great. It worked. This idea of speaking to people or being sent to people that are different than you are. Like I did a little podcast a year ago Christmas with four-year-olds. If you want something to scare you, be like a 76-year-old guy talking to four-year-olds. I mean, that's it. And, and so I was trying to have a conversation with them, but it was just, it was fun being with them. And I said, so what's the greatest thing about Christmas? And all these kids say, getting presents. And I said, well, yeah, it's great to get presents, but isn't it also tremendous to be able to give presents? And a few of them said, and this one little kid said, no way. You know. Just... So here's Isaiah. This is how he describes his encounter with God. In the year that King Isaiah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, two they covered their feet, with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. And it says that one of the angels flew and put a coal on his lips and healed him. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And I said, Here am I. 
Send me. Can you imagine Isaiah in the presence of the Most High God, face down on the ground, I think, in my imagination, not wanting to breathe, not wanting to disturb the moment? What a moment when somebody says, here am I, send me. I told you the story of the senator friend I had some years ago. We went down to Concord, North Carolina, outside of Charlotte, and we were at a church. They had snow, four inches of snow, which kind of shut things down. And they had multiple services. We went to the first one, and there were about, I don't know, 80 people there. And it's a big church, a couple thousand people. And the senator had talked to me because he liked to sing gospel music. And he said, Dick, I'm going to sing this song. You come up and do it with me. At a certain point, I'll call you up. I'm sitting in the front row. And so he gets to that place, and he, and he says, and I have, someone's going to come and help me. He didn't say, I have. He just said, someone's going to come and help me. And I didn't know if that was my moment or what, so I didn't move. And then he said, so, you know, he's going to come and, and help me. And I'm waiting for him to say, my friend Dick is going to come and help me. And he didn't. And, and finally he said, is there anybody here who can help me? And from the back row, a guy said, I will. And he got up and walked down to the front, and it was a gentleman about 50 years old who had Down syndrome. And he walked up and he put his arms around the senator, put his head on his chest, and by that time I'm up there, duly embarrassed, and, uh, and we sing this together. And so the senator asks him to stay for the next two services and sing with us again. And by the time we're done, he's Frank Sinatra back in the day. You know, just he's with it. And, but the senator said, what, what would the culture be like if people across the country, when asked to do something, would just say, I will? I wonder if God says that. I'm going to put out this call, and I wonder who's going to say, I will. Here am I. Send me. Jesus models it. In John 1, and I'm, going to just, I'm just going to read several scriptures. The scriptures are more important than my comments on them, okay? I'm just going to read several scriptures. John 1, he came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. So the sending piece is, is linked, is based, is rooted in the eternal. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, not of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. Everywhere everywhere in the Gospels we see this. Matthew, the 11th chapter, Jesus says, Come to me, all you are overworked and burdened, and I will give you rest. Matthew 28 says, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, therefore go and make disciples. Here's that come and go piece working. The evening of the resurrection day, Jesus has come back from the dead, and he shows up in the upper room, in the room where the disciples are, and he says to them, peace be with you, which is a good thing to say if you just like show up in the room. And as the Father, this is what he says, as the Father sent me, I'm sending you. It says that he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they're not forgiven. And when I have taught on that particular text, I'm saying forgiveness is the message. And when I forgive people, I can't do it like for eternity, but when I forgive them for something against me, it's a window on the kingdom of God because the kingdom of God is this forgiveness reconciling, forgiving reconciling place. So you say, okay, okay, I get it. We're sent, but why? Because it's about sharing life. You're a life bringer. When you, it's not some little creedal thing. It's not some few words or a couple of scriptures. It's that when you walk into the room, if you in fact have had an encounter with the Most High God, there's something about you that is different. I had a friend, I've talked to you about him. He was a specialist in spectroscopy, which is the use of light for scientific measurement. And he sat on the advisory board for the National Institutes of Health. And he talked about coming to D.C., a bunch of years ago, and in, in talking about that, he said, I came here for a meeting of NIH advisory board, but I'd read a book by this woman who lived in Arlington, Virginia, an older woman, and it was just so captivating that I wanted to meet her, and he said, we agreed to meet at the Mayflower Hotel, and she, he said, Dick, when she walked into the lobby, a different presence came into the room. This is how Jesus said it to Martha. I am the resurrection and the life. 
The one who believes in me will live even though they die, and whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? It isn't just that we're bringing a message. It isn't that we're bringing some good social works. It isn't just that we're helping the poor, whatever it is. It's that you're actually bringing life by your presence, by your deed, and by your word. Uh, some years ago when I was a young pastor, I was blowing and going and doing all these things and traveling, and we had four kids under the age of seven, and Ruth was at home with four kids, and I'm doing all these things, and we had discussions about that. I'll let you frame that in your own minds. <laughs> and for my birthday one year, she's, she's a, a poet, and she, she doesn't run off at the mouth like I do. She, she actually thinks before she speaks. And uh, she wrote this for me, and I carried it in my wallet for many, many years, and then uh, somehow I lost it, and this last birthday, she rewrote it and gave it to me again. And it was the image of a water carrier in a third world culture, China or India, where you carry a pole and buckets on the end. It's this, water carrier, you who carry buckets of sloshing cold water on strong shoulders, sometimes the weight must tire you, drag you down, cause you pain. And there are those who would not understand, laugh at you, discourage you. Even I would take your hand, slow you down, hold you back. Water carrier, don't let any of us stop you from bringing us life. You are a life bringer. And Paul, and I'm not going to read the text, but Paul in 2 Corinthians 5 calls us ambassadors of reconciliation. Ambassadors of reconciliation. What do ambassadors do? They represent the interests of the nation. They in this case, they represent the interests and the, the provision, the capacities of the kingdom. In this case, the kingdom of God is salt and light and peace and patience. Think about it. Salt doesn't go out there and just say, boy, I hope I can really be salty. I would, or light says, well, you know... I, no, they just are, if you will. And the Almighty has the authority to call and empower and send you life bringers. I've said it before, we at NCC are an agency of the sender, if you will, a launch platform. We're not far from the Navy Yard in this Capitol Hill location, and, and, uh, and of course the um, Capitol turnaround is now coming online, if you will. And the Navy Yard uh, has memories for me because I have a friend by the name of Vern Clark who came here back in the late 90s as the chief for operations for the Joint Chiefs of Staff. He was a three-star admiral. I used to work for his dad. And again, I, I don't come from any kind of highfalutin background, anything like that. But I was in this space and people came and I had this, this friend named Vern Clark. And one time, that's where a lot of admirals lived, down the Navy Yard, and I, and I drove him in. To, we'd been someplace and I drove him in and when we came through the gate, the young lieutenant, I think, who was at the gate at that time, snapped to attention and saluted the admiral. The admiral did it. I, dropped some, I dropped him off at his house and I circled back around and of course, the young lieutenant doesn't know who I am. We're both in civilian clothes. And as I came out, he snapped to attention and gave me one of those. And I went, he had no idea <laughs> that my full service was one semester of Air Force ROTC at Cal Berkeley in 1959, which is like a philosophy class, not military at all. But that's one of my memories. But the other memory was when he then became head of the Navy. I walked in one day. And he said, Dick, have you ever been on an aircraft carrier? I said, you know, when I was 17 in Oakland, California, the USS Ranger came in. I took a tour. He said, no, 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 at sea. I said, no. He said, we need to do that. So he let me bring some of my friends, and we went down to Norfolk Navy Base, and we got on this, this plane, a prop plane called a cod that they used to carry material and people out. And we strapped in with a racing harness kind of thing and helmets and goggles that's to catch your eyeballs when they throw you off the aircraft carrier. They have goggles and, and a life vest, and we fly 100 miles off the coast of Virginia and land on the USS George Washington at 180 miles an hour. And you stop like in two seconds, just bam, like that. And I mean, this is a huge ship, an aircraft carrier. 
And that's, that's what NCC has sort of become. They start out as like a destroyer, a gunboat. They, you know, they're able to, to use the metaphor, able to turn on a dime. But we are now a launch platform for this. You know, this is a 100,000 ton displacement ship. It's three football fields long. It takes six miles to stop and loads of fire, 5,000 sailors and all of this. And, and we got to stay overnight. And I stepped out of the plane and walked into the wardroom, and the admiral was there, and we shook his hand, and then the captain, and all these. And I got down to the last guy, and a young lieutenant stepped forward, or maybe a captain, I don't know, but he stepped forward and he said, Hi, President Foth, nice to see you again. And he was a student at the college where I had been for those years, and now he's the chaplain on the USS George Washington. Because you never know when God sends you where you're going to end up. You never know what the con. That's part of the adventure. That's part of the excitement. And so that night he came to me and he said, um, when they turned the smoking lamp, lamp down, which is Navy language, I guess, on a ship for going to bed, he said, we always have a prayer, 90 seconds from the bridge. Would you like to do that? Would you like to say a prayer for 5,000 sailors? I said, you kidding me? I went up and for, for 90 seconds plowing through the Atlantic, had a chance to pray God's care and blessing on 5,000 young men and women who were being sent. That's the nature of what that is. We are ambassadors. We're all on a mission. And what, what we found out that day, we talked to people from the admiral to the guys fixing jets on the fantail of the ship to the cooks. There's an officer in charge of the anchor on an aircraft carrier. I had no idea. And the thing they had in common was that they all knew the mission. They all knew the mission, what they were about. And I'm thinking we're ambassadors of reconciliation. And our response to God when we have an encounter with the Most High is, here am I, send me. We don't know where that is. Sometimes it's to just neighborhoods. I say just. That's a, that's a powerful, intimate place or a coffee group, or a military base, or a school, or an office, or the institution where you work, or a running club, or a pickup basketball gang, or chess team, or you're a soccer mom, whatever. Maybe even you're sent to your family. Sometimes being sent to one's family is the greatest challenge on the planet. Let me close with this. I've shared this story over the years, one of my favorite, and I never hesitate to share it again. I'm a young pastor in Urbana, Illinois, near the University of Illinois. I'm 28 years old and I'm a stutterer, still. And um, I get a call from a fraternity house at the university and some, uh, some folks had come through. I think they were with what is called crew now. They had come through a number of the young men had come to faith in Jesus. And they called up and said, we understand you work with young people because I was young, I was 28 and the young congregation. They said, would you come over and hold Bible studies for us at the fraternity house? Now, this was the raunchiest fraternity house at the University of Illinois. They were on probation for sacrificing a pig in their annual spring ritual. They, they would sandbag their parking lot and have an orgy every spring. And so I said, okay. So I went over there and we were sitting around talking. And, and that went on for eight months. A number of other fraternity brothers and sorority sisters came to faith. Eight months later, I get a call and it's an older man. He said, uh, I'm so-and-so, and I understand you know my son John at such-and-such such fraternity house. I said, I do. He said, uh, he's radically changed in eight months, just radically changed. And he said, he says it's God. What do you say, Mr. Foth? I said, I say it's God. He said, I want to talk to you. And I'm going, oh, boy. I said, he said, I'd like you to come for dinner. Well, when you throw food in the equation, you know, even if you're scared, you, and so... And so I go to his house for dinner. It turns out what I, what I, you know, I'm, I'm a stutterer. So I'm this pipsqueak preacher stutterer guy. And I'm going to the house of this full professor in journalism. He's a Pulitzer Prize winning professor in journalism. He's a political cartoonist for the Boston Globe. And he's a Harvard fellow. That means he's real smart. And I'm thinking, God must say, why don't we put the stutterer with the Pulitzer Prize winning author and see how that goes, you know? <laughs> God has a great sense of humor, the king of the universe does. And so I go there, we have the dinner, and I'll hurry along here. And, and we, after dinner, we're sitting around talking. It was back during the Vietnam years, and the tension on campus was just horrendous. And his son's peers had spit on everything this man stood for in his academic career. 
And he said, he's changed, and I've been angry, and I just, but uh, tell me about this God he talks about. So I started talking about the God who is. I am the God who goes before you. I am that I am. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the beginning. I am the, that God. And I got a few minutes into it, and I just said, um, Fred, would you, like to, would you like to know that God? And without hesitation, he said, I would. I said, you would. He said, yeah, how do I do that? I said, well, it says if we just call on him, if we just talk to him. I said, uh, would you like me to help you with that? Which is sort of arrogant sounding, but at the moment it seemed right. And he said, I would. I said, I'm going to say some phrases out loud and you just follow me. He said, okay. I said, dear God, this is Fred. He said, dear God, this is Fred. You know my anger and my rage. You know my anger and my rage. You know the frustrations I feel, the frustrations I feel. I ask that you would come in and change my life, make me a new guy, turn me inside out. Forgive me, Lord. Come into my heart. Make, you know, I can't remember all the words, but it was short. It wasn't very long. Then I said, amen. He said, amen. And I looked up and looked at him, and he wasn't looking at me. He was looking at his boy because his boy had been sent, if you will, to his family. This great gulf existed. And he looked at him, and he just stood up and started toward him. And he stood up and started toward his dad, and they met right in front of me, and they embraced, and they just wept. And I'm watching, you know. And pretty soon, he, t he pushed his boy away, and he said, Dick, do you understand what's happening here tonight? I said, I think I do, but why don't you tell me? <laughs> and then the Pulitzer Prize-winning author came out. He said, I believe that 2,000 years ago, God gave his son to me. But tonight, my son gave me God. Then I start bawling. I get up and I put my arms around you. <laughs> when you have a face-to-face -face encounter and you meet that God and he, and he shows us who he is and he says, come here and be ready to go there. When he says, who shall I send? I would pray for each one of us that we just say, here I am, send me. Father, thank you for your grace and your mercy. Thank you for the power of your spirit to shape us, to frame our lives, that you care about not just the big sendings, but the intimate moments, the quiet nuance, the cup of coffee, the sitting with a friend, those things are so powerful, and you call us to moments like that. So I thank you for this grand congregation that you've put together and the one that is scattered around the world because we're all part of your congregation called the kingdom of God. In Jesus' name, amen.